Hey everyone, today on Hello Church, we have seven tips for planning a church from Church Planners. My name is Justin Trapp. I'm Wade Bearden. Thank you for checking out Hello Church. And we do have to make a disclaimer before this episode. We were thinking about church planning and people have asked us, hey, do an episode on church planning. The problem is... Yeah. We haven't planted a church. I've never planted a church as a lead pastor. We've been a part of church plants. Yeah. yeah. We're at a church plant. Yeah, we've had the benefit we're on staff of staff at a church plant right we've now. We've had the benefit of, of helping and being involved but yeah, not yeah. carrying that burden, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow, we helped the church plant, but it really wasn't yeah. that as cra- hard on us. That, as it was. that crown looks pretty heavy there, Pastor. <laughs> Let me take a couple jewels off, put yeah. it in mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking the other day too, you know, like the church planning movement is 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 huge right now, and mm-hmm. it's really great. Um, but do you think in the future, instead of calling it church planning, they'll call it something else like church birthing or church? Because has church planning always been around? So I've been thinking of like where could we go from? Yeah, here? I mean, if you're a church planner, you like the church planner conversations, like, hey, what what uh, where are you at? Well, I'm in my first trimester. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. I think I think uh, it worked. Church birthing. Okay, so we mentioned we haven't planted a church. No. Um, but so what we did, we're friends, we're friends with a lot of people who've yeah. planted churches yeah. by, because we knew a lot of youth pastors who went on to plant and churches, hashtag ministry pass, <laughs> hashtag ministry pass. Uh, and so we reached out to a lot of our friends and we asked them for tips. And so we're going to give you yeah. seven tips that kind of kept popping up. Mm-hmm. And we'd love if you're a church planner to let us know what you think of these tips and to really keep the conversation going, because I feel like this is the beginning of a conversation. So we always say this at the end, I'll say at the beginning, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to comment. You can also use hashtag HelloChurchPod, and you can send that over on social media, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, all of those things. Well, and let me say this, you're about to like close the window or press pause or go to a different episode because you're not planning a church, but I would say, at least five of these tips can apply to any church of any size. Yeah, yeah. So I let, think that's good. Let, let's dive right in. The first one is to find the influencers in your community. When I, what we mean by that is find either the people or the organizations in your community that have lots of influence, mm-hmm. that have uh, awareness in the community, and build a relationship with them. Partner with them because as you're the new kid on the block. If you align yourself with the influencers, maybe some business leaders, or there's an organization, or there's a food bank that has, uh, you know, just been a staple in the community for a long time, and you partner with them, that really goes a lot, a long way uh, for for your church being the, you know, sort of the new organization or our parachute into that community, mm. and that's gonna. Uh, pay huge dividends down the road as you're working through uh, the business and, 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 and you know, community and networking. Yeah, and, and serve your community before you ask of your Absolutely. community. And, and when you find these influencers, you, you'll you begin to attend the festivals, you'll begin to attend the community events, the neighborhood events, and as you do that, you'll start to learn more about your community. Especially if you're like moving into a new place, you might have this idea of what our church is going to look like. But as you spend time with these individuals, I think what you'll what you'll find is, well, maybe maybe I need to change that vision a bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe I need to uh, find a different angle because I'm reaching these people here right now. And we kept hearing that from church planners. It's really all about getting into the community and learning, learning. more about them and, and helping them to to learn more about yourself too because uh, you definitely want to do that as you go to a new place and as you plan a new church. Another thing you could do is, I know we know obviously social media is a huge thing, but, but see if you can actually find uh, social media influencers in in your community that maybe have a large following for whatever reason, and if you're able to connect with them, uh, they may be able to help spread the word when you eventually plant down the road. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously, um, you know, like Wade said, go go with you know arms open wide. Like, hey, I'm here to serve. We're a new church plant. We're here. Is there anything we can partner with you on? Is there any you know we have some volunteers? Is there anything you need done? Always you know come with a servant's heart first and of course um we know you guys are already doing that it kind of goes without being said the second thing is 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 a really interesting one to me and Mm -hmm. it's probably not one that i heard a lot of church planners say but a few of them said this and 
there's actually a distinction between the ones that said this and the ones that didn't, and that is target high capacity donors. Mm-hmm. And what we mean by this, though, is one of the the the, the tips from from the church planner said, "Hey, look, I got a lot of large donations from people that never have come to my church, mm-hmm. and I, I got large donations from from one person that that." I'm not even sure he's a Christian, mm-hmm. you know, but, but I told them the story. I told them our story, my, my family's story, what we wanted to do, how we wanted to impact the community, and then asked them if they'd like to be a part of that, that, mm-hmm. that, that history and that, and that vision. And, and they, they made a large donation. And so, yes, people at your church that are, that are coming in, right, your, your core team, your launch team, they're, they're going to be essential, right? They're going to be faithful givers, hopefully. Uh, but, don't just target those people. Try to target people that are that have the capacity, right? The 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 uh, the means to to do something significant for your church, and it might not be necessarily significant for them, but it's significant for your church. And and the, the, the quote was: spend eighty percent of your time targeting those people, and spend the other twenty percent just talking about generosity and giving as a whole. Yeah. I thought it was a really fascinating approach. Yeah, it, it is. You've got a lot of people out there. Uh, some of them are Christians that go to another church. Uh, some of them might not be Christians, but they want to give their money away to a good cause. And it's, fa- it's, it's amazing how God can work in someone's mm-hmm. heart who might live hours away from where you're planning a church to give. But there are people who want to invest in that, and there are people who are happy to invest in that. And we've, we know churches who have received uh, huge donations from people, like you said, who never attended their church, and it really set them up. So small donations are important, and it's also important, right, not look at the big donations and think that they're better or there's requires no. more sacrifice, but um, God can take that and do some amazing things. So we would encourage you to just really kind of shake down those trees and be bold sometimes in what you ask for. And I've seen some people ask for some big things and it's just like wild and the person said yes, or they said Maybe a little bit less, but I'll, but I'll give you something. I know one church plant in the first two years of the budget that they were trying to raise, one person donated like a third mm. of that budget. And that person never was going to go to the church. And, and I know what you're thinking. It's like, oh, I wish I knew someone like that rich or, or they just got lucky. Well, they actually fostered and worked on that relationship and nurtured that relationship. And then they actually went, like Wade said, and made the big ask and said, hey, can you be able, like, like we're looking for a few people to be to do something meaningful and significant. And and you have the means and, and to do something significant like most people can't. And I would be... Uh, very grateful if you'd be a part of what what we feel like God has called us to do with our lives and our family's lives over the next few years. And that person wrote them a massive six-figure check, and that would not have happened had they not asked, had they not fostered and nurtured that relationship. And what did that do? That changed the trajectory of the first two or three years of their church because they have to worry. They didn't have to like barely, you know, eating beans and barely making it week to week trying. Mm -hmm. They they didn't have to worry about that stuff. They could focus on building their team, growing the church, discipling people. And so, you know, this point I think is an interesting point, um, but it can't, it can't be uh, left out. The, the, The next one is, is fun. Um, essentially when you dive into a community, right? Mm -hmm. One of the most important things, if you are the new kid on the block and you're wanting to partner with the influencers, you're wanting to meet with high capacity donors, one of the things that you've really got to do is you've got to really figure out a way to articulate your story. Mm-hmm. Like, wh- where have you come from? Like, why are you doing this? Why, why would your family move or, or, or just go from one state? Like, we know a pastor, they moved from, like, rural Texas uh, out here, and they just parachuted right in. Like, mm-hmm. and just have, felt like God called our family to this area. Mm-hmm. I had no relations here, nothing. Just literally parachuted in. Uh, but what he did a really great job is he did a really great job of sharing his story with everybody he met and what he felt like God had called him to do and how that was going to impact the community. And so what you need to do is, is you need to invest in some great photography. You need to ingress in a great, uh, like an intro video, what I would call, like a like your story, your testimony mm. type of video, like an introduction to, like if someone hears about your church plant and they go to your website, this is the video that they see first mm-hmm. that introduces them to you and your family and and sort of the, the ministry that God has called you to in this area. And then I'd say work with a copywriter. Oh yeah, yeah. Because 
uh, a lot of times it's hard to articulate efficiently and, and effectively your story in a way that that grabs people and 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 inspires them and motivates them to either be a part or donate or follow you just to kind of they want to track the progress and sometimes it takes working with someone that is professional with words that's just what they do they 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 work with words and they're great at taking uh, you know our jumbled mess on a whiteboard and crafting mm-hmm. into something that you can just kind of spit out for the next 18 months, right? And so I would in, make sure that you invest in great photography, a great intro video doesn't have to be long, and then work with make sure you work with a copywriter because man, how many times when we were doing back in the old days before ministry passed, you work with a client or a church and. The easy part, right, was the graphics. The easy part was setting up the website. Oh, yeah. The hardest part was like filling the pages with words. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and as if you're designing a website, you're always like, "Hey, I need your copy. Hey, yeah. I need your copy." Uh, you know, I had a that friend was always who, the last thing. I had a friend who, who planted a church, and a lot of people in the community, like when when this pastor met them, they were all like, "Well, why?" Like we've got, I mean, we've got some churches here, but like. But why? Like, why are you planting here? And it's always so important that whether you're meeting with just people in the community or whatever, that you have a well-articulated vision of saying, hey, this is this is what we believe God wants us to do. And then just curiosity. People just want to know what you're about. You know, you're new here. Okay, well, I want to check you out. So that is super important. And I think w- what we do a lot of times is we just, we, we focus on the logo and the website, how good it looks, but yeah. you need to be able to articulate your story. Yeah. You know, the next point that we have, number four, and I've been seeing this um, more recently. Don't be afraid to align or merge with like-minded ministries. So there are two ways that you can do that. The first is kind of simple. Uh, back whenever I was younger, we had in our church a mission sort of organization that our church created, and we would do everything. We would uh, serve people in this community. We would head up an organization that that served people in another community. And it was really great, but what I've seen churches doing now is they'll partner with an organization that's already in a community, their community, and they will work with them. So instead of saying, okay, I've got to hire this person or get this person to create this organization and start doing this work, we say, hey, these people are doing it really well. Like, let's let's partner with them. And so when people come to us and say, hey, I really want to serve, where what can I do? Say, hey, our team is actually working with their team. So I think that's great. And then the second thing is we've seen churches, more churches merging together. Yeah. Pastors who are saying, man, if, if we take my staff and your staff and we bring our church together, like we can do really cool stuff. So think about that as you're planning a church. Could there be a church that you merge with? Yeah. And that that could get messy, right? But we've seen it work really well with some organizations. Our church just merged with another church. And it can be it can actually be incredible if it, if it's done right. Well, when you look across the, the, the landscape in your community and maybe there's a, another organization where the, the the church culture is very similar, the team culture is very similar. Mm-hmm. You share common visions about how, what the local church should look like. Uh, it might like you, yeah, you're running these parallel paths, right? And what you want to both accomplish independently may take five, seven years, eight years, 10 years, right? But if you merge and combine your efforts together, you may be able to do it in three. Mm-hmm. And so th- that that is sort of some of the upside. Is there an inherent risk? Uh, you know, yes, obviously. Uh, do egos have to be adjusted, right? And do um, you know? Does it make everyone on your team and, and maybe your church a little bit uncomfortable for a season? Of course. Anytime there is change, there is uh, comfort, right? Oh, I love the phrase though. You you can have comfort or you can have courage, but you can't have both. Ooh, and, interesting. And so, like, yeah, yes, there's some inherent risk, but th- there's some large churches in our area. That, that have grown pretty significantly over the last five years. But when you when you trace it back to what really were the catalysts for their growth and for them making a, a much greater impact, it was uh, two churches that were similar size, similar staff, similar budgets. They began to say, should we, would this, wouldn't this just be better if we did it together? Mm-hmm. Because our team is really strong in this area and your team is really strong in that area. And combining, we, we create such a balance uh, from a personnel standpoint, but from a strengths and talent standpoint. Um, and I, I've, you know, our church merged at the end of, well, no, really at the beginning of this past year, right? Yeah. Officially. And I've actually noticed a, a great 
um, balance that has happened in our services, with our team, with our leadership. And I think it's actually been a very complimentary merge. Mm -hmm. Now we're sort of in the honeymoon stage, of course, uh, but we've seen a lot of churches do it and do it well. And so you have to ask yourself, like, if there's others around you and you share the same vision, you share the same heart for the community, would it make better sense to do it together? Um, maybe not, but it is worth asking and having a conversation about nonetheless. Uh, another thing, uh, the the fifth thing on, on the tips is, you know, th this really comes from like a marketing standpoint. Now this, this goes for like, if you're going to do a large event, so like an Easter or, or you're launching a church. Um, but you, what you want to do is you don't want to create, you don't want to be promoting at a 10 all the time. You want to mm. create what I call marketing spikes. So you see this with like big boxing fights or big blockbusters with movies where they will have this focused amount of energy <clears throat> in, a, in a specific amount of time, right? So like a, a two day window or a week window where they're just blitzing to create awareness mm. months and months and months before the, the, the event comes out. And then there's a lull, right? And you think there's a lull. Is it, it's actually intentional, right? They just sort of like relax. And then they're blitzing again. And so they're creating these peaks, but what they're doing with these peaks is they're just generating awareness. And so, and they're introducing new things and new wrinkles every time they have these blitzes. Uh, with your marketing, if you're launching a church, you want to make sure that you have these peaks planned and intentional where you're investing. You're not investing, uh, you know, $2,000 every month to Facebook ads, but maybe you're doing it in, you know, 12 months out and then maybe you're doing it eight months out and then maybe you're doing it four months out where you are generating these peaks of awareness that are going to really, really help you over a long period of time so that when you do actually launch or you have a big event at your church, um, the, the seed had been planted months and months and months and weeks ago and you're able to sort of, mm. uh, you know, water that seed over time and that's going to be really, really beneficial for your event or for launching a church, and then yeah. uh, speaking of planning, uh, we're partial to this, but one of the, this this actually is a tip that, yeah. that we 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 had come in, and it's basically yeah. make sure that you plan your first year of content. You you don't want to be sort of in the weeds every single week when you're planning in a yeah. church. The first year is so hard. Make sure that you just plan out your first year of content because you also want to be intentional. Like as these people are joining our movement, our ministry, what do we want them to learn about God? Yeah. Like, how do we how do we want to grow together as disciples of Christ in this first year? Yeah. Well, and things can always change, but if you have that roadmap, it's so important. I remember in Bible college, they um, one of my professors had us create a three month preaching plan, and they said, "Hey, put this aside." but you're gonna need it whenever you start pastoring. And it was so helpful. And I still remember just kind of working through the book of James and a couple other sermon series um, in that three month time. And it was great to be like, okay, I know what I'm preaching three weeks from now. I know what I'm preaching four weeks from now. And if you can do that, that is just gonna be a huge win. You can also even just right now, you can pull it out and you could say, Okay, uh, three months from now, I'm going to have a guest speaker. I'll give them, the, you know, this is the passage. And at Ministry Pass, that's what we try to do for pastors. We have 12-month calendars. We also have a one-year sermon series called The Gospel Story. Um, so whatever you want to do, whether you want to have 10 different sermon series across the year or just a couple, we've got that for you. If you want to use Ministry Pass or not, I think the point remains is make sure you're planning out that that content. It's it's so important. Uh, and then number seven is have a great support system, not in church, but outside as well. And we, we heard this come up with a number of church planners. This is good for like any pastor. It, it really uh, is. Any size church, really. You need to have pastors and friends and advisors outside of your church that you can talk to about what's going on and you can get tips. It, I mean, it is just, it's not sustainable for you to be alone and really feel like I'm, I'm on a silo. And uh, yeah, whether you're church planning or not, I think it's so important to, to create that support system. Yeah, it is important. And you need to be able to be around people and be able to vent to people that understand where you're at. Because as your church grows, as you have more leaders under you, as you have more volunteers under you, you can begin to feel, um, in some ways, more lonely. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you at the top, so to speak, and uh, it's unhealthy for you to be, uh, you know, sort of isolated 
um, and, and, and lonely at the top by yourself. You, you need those partners to come around you and help you and, and to be, uh, you know, strength when you need strength yeah. and, 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 and uh, you know, a sounding board when, when you need a sounding board. And the, the, the last tip. <laughs> so this is the bonus tip. We said yeah, so seven we, tips for planning a church this, from this church planning. This is the planning. bonus tip. This is the bonus tip. I text a friend of mine who's doing really well. They're in year three, maybe. Uh, year f- yeah, year three of a church plan. I said, hey, what is your best tip for church planning? <laughs> and his response was, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing, man. It used to be whenever, and this was like, 12 years ago, whenever I started out as a youth pastor, it was super hard to get a full-time youth pastor job because everybody was doing it. Yeah, And I have been hearing from churches and they're like, it's difficult to find youth pastors. Why? Because more and more younger individuals are planning churches yeah. earlier and earlier, which has its pros, which can be good. Yeah, But it also creates this environment where church planning is the cool or trendy thing to do. Yeah, And you never want to do something just because it's cool or trendy. So... Don't plan a church unless you feel like God has called you to do it. Don't just do it because you feel like you need to do it or because everybody else is doing it, mm-hmm. because all your college friends are doing it. Do it because that's where you believe God wants you to be. And if not, then and you plan a church and, and, and you don't feel like that's what God wants you to do. You just did it because you thought you needed to do it. Um, it has the potential to end really badly. I had people talk to me. I was served at a church. We talked about me planning a campus. We talked about me planning a church. We had church consultants come in and they'd meet with me and I'm on the executive team and they'd be like, Hey, you're, you're the, you know, you're have the stereotypical wiring as they described it for playing a church. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the end of the day, like I just never felt like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, Hmm. you know, you need to go do this. And so uh, I didn't, but it was a battle. I felt like uh, I was almost like, you know, it was almost like a, a career path that was predestined for me by a lot of people. It's like, you, you know, you're going to plan a church. It was just assumed. Um, thankfully, I'm able to, to, to serve in areas that are my strengths and giftings, and but in the area of passion, which is the local church. I love being a part mm-hmm. of ministry, love being in a ministry and serving with, with pastors. And so, um, yeah, don't do it if it's, uh, <laughs> don't do it if you're not supposed to. Uh, and then we have another bonus. This is a bonus bonus. I found this website called I want to plant a church.com. It says I want to plant I want to plant a church.com. It's got a really cool outline of like okay, you're a year out, here's what you should be doing. You're yeah. 6 months out, here's yeah. what you should be doing. So, that's a cool resource for you to check out as well. Justin, this is the end of our episode. Yeah. We want to remind everybody, if you planted a church, make sure to, in the comments, just give us some advice. Uh, Give your fellow church planners some ideas. Maybe uh, join our Pastors Circle Facebook group. We've created a community where you can talk about these issues, and I think that's really important because you got to create that network. Whether you're planning a church or you're at a church that's 100 years old, you you really do need that. I appreciate our Pastors Circle group because there's not a lot of theological debate it's really pastors coming together sharing in community and really just uh, wanting to help each other and be helpful Mm -hmm. and uh, I believe a lot of the conversations in our Facebook group have been um, positive and helpful and uh, you know a lot of people seem to really enjoy the the small community that we have there so maybe you don't have an outlet uh, check out the pastor circle on Facebook and uh, we'd love to to hear from you in there and uh, so that's it yeah. For this episode of Hello Church. Next week, we're going to be talking about five apps yeah. for church team collaboration. You need it. A lot of you are working remotely or maybe bivocationally. You need to be able to collaborate and communicate with your team. We're going to talk about that next week.